So here you're looking at the vault tab under slash login. As you can see, I only have one machine that's under management now, but if you go to vault accounts, you can see what we've imported. There's also that personal tab that I was just talking about. But if I go over to the discovery side, you're gonna see a new discovery job, and we've added a secondary type called Windows Local Accounts on Jump Clients. So if I click continue here, I'm now able to go and set this. So I can search all Jump Clients if I want to, but you can also break this down into individual Jump Groups. So you can see I have Hive and Honeycomb here. I'm gonna click Honeycomb because I know that that's where I've set it up. But there's also additional attributes that you could filter data down by. So if you've got a large deployment of things that you're looking for, or you're looking for something very specific, I'm able to do this. So now it's already returned back the list of the Jump Clients that I've got installed. I've only got two, so you pull up my Access Console, Rep Console, you can see those two there. I'm gonna say I wanna select Zeta 2, and I'm gonna do a dis start discovery. It's gonna be pretty instantaneous. It was one machine discovering those accounts. But as you can see, it's got the endpoint and the local account. So the disabled accounts are being shown. I'm gonna pick the credentials that I want to import into the vault. As you can see, it auto-selected the endpoint as well. And now here's this new feature called account grouping, where I can actually set the credentials and put them in a bucket of, or a key ring of sorts, that I can now assign by a group policy to other groups. So this is my admin stuff. Start import, yes. And I've imported. Pretty quick, pretty easy. You can see what's going on. So now if I go back to that accounts tab, you can see those credentials that I just imported in. I'm gonna go down to the rotate me credential. Of course, to actually take it under management, you do have to rotate it. So I had discovered it. Now there's the rotate part. So now that credential has been rotated. I don't know what that credential is anymore. It is now being managed by the vault, but I can now use that to go access and do a session using that credential. Another benefit of this is we've updated the vault reporting. So vault reporting now has the ability to look like session reports. You can download it, save it off if you need to, but I can show you my history of who took action, what credentials, where they were used, why they were used. And if I scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see Zeta 2 and that it was manually rotated by admin. Now, this also links directly over to your session reports. So if I go and click details on a session of where that credential was used, I can go and see the session details. So very quick and very easy. If you're using Vault, great benefit to have this. Uh, this gives you the ability of potential lapse replacement, but I'm now managing more out of band systems with a jump client that you've already got deployed out in your environment. Now, let me come over here. Next item up for grabs is assign public portals to a team. This is exactly what you think it is. This is me having multiple portal sites on an appliance. And now I'm able to actually assign different groups to use different portals and guarantee that that's the only portal that they're interacting with. Uh, of course, if you upgrade today to 21.1, every rep will have it. It's going to, you know, all members are gonna be doing exactly what you do today, having access to all the portals. You can then go into your configuration and support teams and actually toggle which ones they're interacting with. So this gives you two things uh, that are very helpful. One, it limits who's available on that rep list if you want to use it on that portal site. So instead of seeing every person that's logged into the appliance and having a gigantic list, you can now have a more focused view. If you're a member of multiple portals, uh, you still have that ability of switching between the two, but it gives the ability to lock this down. So if HR was using this to support people, uh, they're not using the default URL. This is giving you granular and KPIs around what portals are being used for what actions. So huge benefit across the board, uh, allowing you to have different public portals that then have different branding or different use cases, one internal, one external, different teams then associated directly to those portals. Here's what it actually looks like. So if you go into that configuration and support teams, you can see the new portal access. And if you untick the box that says allow members access to all portals, then you can select the granularity. So again, using the support teams function and digging deeper into that. We added Mac Big Sur. Of course, that gives me the ability to support Mac Big Sur. Uh, we did backport this. So if you're not going to upgrade to 21.1, if you wanna just do a maintenance release to 21.3, both of them include this functionality. 
Uh, Mac Big Sur was delayed and you know, Mac Apple kept holding back and we didn't know when this was going to come, but we do support Mac Big Sur and Apple Silicon. So giving you the ability to at least do support of those devices. However, we added something a little more fun with that and it's this permission overlay. You now can get into a support session with a, a Catalina or Big Sur device and see this overlay. This overlay is there to serve two functions. One, because it's part of our binary, you can see this at session screen start without them ever giving you access. Two, if the session needs to reboot, instead of it being a green checkbox, it'll be a yellow exclamation point. But those buttons right there where it says grant access take you to the system dialog where you can then walk them through it. Now, once they click it, you can't see them doing that action because that's a privileged action, but you can at least help them and guide them versus having to completely blind walk through step one, step two, step three actions. Now, this helps a lot just getting screen sharing. I can immediately do the first action. I don't necessarily need keyboard access. You can move on. But if you want to do any more actions, it's right there in front of them of why you would want to do it. Again, you really only have to do it once. After that, it's allowed. You won't ever see the screen again. But if they ever wanted to revoke access, it's being presented there to give that level of granularity, a level of security, echoing what Apple's doing with that end user story, but giving support the ability to do convenience and access and accessibility at the same time. Keeping down in that theme of new devices, Raspberry Pi. So this is the long-awaited foray into ARM-based processing. So I know everybody's rejoicing and clapping, yay. What this actually is, is Pi, not the kind you can eat, but Raspberry Pi operating systems. Uh, these are really cool devices for IoT, really can be built into anything. Uh, I've got a video of this as well, where I've got uh, how I put the agent on my system. But I'm able to now support 32-bit only right now. I'm moving to 64-bit, you know, in the future. But I'm now able to have something that's more than just cake. I'm able to have a device that I can support and do headless Linux-based support. Now, coming over to this, my little video here. This is set up under the Jump Clients. So we're creating a new installer. So if you go to Jump Clients or Jump, Jump Clients, excuse me. I'm able to go create a new installer. This is echoing the headless Linux jump client, like I said, but we have an installer specifically called out for Raspberry Pi 32-bit. So there you go, I can click that, and I'm going to go create my binary for it. Do, 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 go download it, of course I can email it to myself, but then you can put this file any way you want to on that device. Uh, it is a bin file, so very convenient on getting that over. Uh, you don't have to worry about it being converted. So then I can, put that out on the system. So I went SCP'd it over there, got it onto my system. As you can see, make sure that when you're using the uh, arguments, the you know specify your jump group of where you want it to show up. Otherwise, it'll show grayed out until then. So just a little tip and trick there. Uh, as you can see, I've got mine showing up in Hive. I immediately can come in. I've got command shell access to my RetroPy system. Uh, if you notice, this is running version 4.9. Uh, so it's, you know, fairly older, it's not the most modern, so I wanted to showcase I'm able to support more operating systems and, and not necessarily just the current version. But you get file transfer and command shell just like you would in a regular headless Linux session, but now this is audited and recorded. So if you're using this for IoT, uh, display signs, uh, gate arms, whatever you're using these creative devices for, I'm now able to support it just like I would a normal Linux operating system. So. Kudos to the dev team for putting this out there. This was a hackathon project that they did uh, that turned into something really cool and you know, really glad that we were able to add this into the pro uh, product. Uh, with this, like I said, it is using the Linux jump client methodology. So it's a headless Linux. There is no GUI on this uh, currently. So just command line, but you, know, you can see the granular tabs. Uh, when you're using the command arguments, like I said, make sure that you're calling out the jump group and don't forget to go create a cron job to have the, the session start and the system start. Now, it's a lot of fun to do. Took me maybe five minutes to set that up. So getting it out there, if I can do it, anybody can do it.